So this is the machine learning class, and um, I intended this to be only an online class, but there has been a lot of interest in a face-to-face -face class. I guess there's a lot of students with no good internet or no good computer at home, uh, more than I expected. So I'm going to open up Science 37 on Saturdays from 11 to 2. Uh, however, the building is officially closed, so you have to come in the door that's closest to Science 37, which I will prop open like I did last semester. So I can unofficially open the building for people who want to come face to face. And that's where I am today, although I don't think anybody's going to know to come today. Anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about the physical attendance. And now we're up to chapter two. Uh, let me just see if more questions have appeared. Can we submit the quizzes late? Yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead. Especially in this class. I don't think there's no punishment for being late. Good. All right. Oh, and I need to plug in my power or it's my computer will die abruptly while I'm attempting to lecture. So let's talk about this chapter two. So we're just going to go through all the steps in the machine learning project, and there is a hands-on project that goes through most of this, and I'm hoping to add the rest to it pretty soon. So you have to look at the picture of the data you've got, then get the data, then explore and visualize the data to see what you have. Uh, you can't usually just use data in its original form. You have to massage it quite a bit before it's ready for machine learning. You prepare the data, then you select a model and train it, fine tune it, and you know if your solution is approved by whatever authority is above you, then you can launch it, monitor it, and maintain it. So to get real data, there's a bunch of online data that people traditionally use for machine learning projects, a bunch of online resources with a publicly available data, which is what we're going to use, great for learning, and representative of the kind of data that you have to deal with. So you have to frame the problem. In this case, what we're going to try to do is to predict we have a bunch of data from 1990 about housing prices in California, which is why these housing prices are going to seem very low. And <coughs> they broke California up into districts, and they gave you a bunch of information about uh, the population and the number of bedrooms in houses and income in an area, and we're going to try to predict the housing price from that data. And the purpose of this is going to be a data pipeline, they call this, where data goes from one process to another. They're hoping to replace this manual price estimating process at the company with machine learning, and then it will pass into a different machine learning system that will figure out, based on the expected price of houses, whether to make an investment in housing in that area. So we're just trying to do this part here with the uh, light bulb on it. <clears throat> so you first have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. All right. So now we have to choose general parameters. Now the data is labeled. The incoming data <coughs> has a bunch of information about the district, including the median house price in that district. So that's labeled data. We know what the right answer is for the training data, um, and for that matter, for the test data. So we want regression, because regression is where you fit um, some kind of uh, model to the data so you can predict a value. And what we're going to, hoping to do is to predict the median housing price for a new area given these other parameters. And we're only going to do one batch of data. We're not going to have continuous updates, so batch learning will do. These are referring to the concepts we talked about last time. So there's types of regression. The one we're going to use here is multiple regression, where you use multiple input features to predict one value. Other ways to do it is univariate regression, where you predict a single value, and um, I think we're also only predicting one value. Multivariate regression predicts multiple values, and we're only trying to predict one value in the data right now. So now you have to have some measure of how accurately your model is uh, matching the data. The most common way to do this is the root mean square error. This has been the recommended uh, most, this is called the Euclidean norm. It goes all the way back to Euclid. It's the standard way to do it. So you just take the observed value and subtract the predicted value and take the difference and square it. And then you take the square root of the sum of all that. 
So this gives you a measure of uh, how wrong you are, and it's equally considered equally as wrong to be predicted too low as to predict it too high. And predictions that miss by a lot are weighted more heavily because of the square, and this is what's generally considered to be the best procedure. And the reason it's uh, recommended is because if your data has a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution where it has an equal chance of being above or below, um, then this is the mathematically best way to measure the error. However, there are other ways to do it. Another thing you might do, if your data has many outliers, which means it's basically a long tail not obeying a uh, Gaussian distribution, so there's some values that are way off, like five times too big or 10 times too big, then um, the Manhattan norm would be better. This just counts the absolute difference between where you are and where you want to be, and they call it the Manhattan norm because in two dimensions, this is where you count the number of blocks you'd have to walk to get somewhere. Um, anyway, that's an uh, alternative performance measure that might be appropriate for data that departs from Gaussian distribution by a lot. <coughs> and in principle, you could just have a variety of powers other than the square, but those are the most common ones. So we're going to assume the price will be used as a numerical value. Now, if, if we were going to just, but if the next stage in the pipeline, she, this is what we do to predict a number for the numerical value. But if the next stage didn't actually use the numerical value, but just sort it into categories like cheap, medium, and high, then we really ought to include that in our model from the start, rather than producing the wrong kind of data, which then has to go through a quantization step, it would be better to just go immediately to the right kind of data. And that's a classification job. But what we want here is we actually want a number. So that's a regression job where you're fitting a curve through something expecting to predict numbers. So now we get the data. You can just load it from GitHub with a code like we've seen before. Um, you get, it's a publicly available data. If you use the head method of housing, you will see the first five rows. And here you see the information you have, um, total number of rooms, total bedrooms, population, median income, median house value, and ocean proximity is near bay. That column is going to be a problem. It's not a number. So we're going to have to deal with non-numerical data. All right, you can do value counts. And when you count ocean proximity, you see it has, in fact, five values, five on an island and these other things like inland or less than one H from an ocean, I guess house from an ocean. I don't really know. Anyway, uh, so that's the actual contents of that ocean proximity value. We'll have to get back to that later. Then you can use describe. This will show you statistics of all the data. So it shows you the count of non-empty values, and then the mean, standard, minimum, and so on. Notice that there are 2,640 rows of data. All these numbers are 2,640, except for this one. Total bedrooms is only 2,433, so that's another problem. There are some data rows that do not include this number for total number of bedrooms. So empty values in about 200 of them, uh, that's going to be another problem that the data will have to deal with. <coughs> so you can calculate histograms of data, and these give you uh, the distribution of data. You can see here that longitude and uh, latitude are not distributed like Gaussian at all. In fact, as anybody could tell you, this is California data, so most of the houses are either in the northern latitude, um, northern, yeah, northern latitude because of San Francisco, or the southern near Los Angeles, two big peaks. So uh, here's housing median age, and here's other things. Another thing to notice is the median house value is not a Gaussian, it's got a long tail. Quite a few of these variables have an asymmetric distribution, a long tail on the right. And uh, We'll fix that later by taking the uh, square root or the logarithm of the data to even that out. All right, so median income is not in dollars. It's been scaled and uh, capped at 15 max and 0 0.5 minimum. That's another issue. Notice that the values are very different. Um, the total number of rooms, I guess in district, goes up to like 20,000 or something. Uh, the median income just goes up to like 15. And so, if, this is a problem with machine learning. If you have one thing that is going up to like 20,000, and another thing is only going up to 10, then it will regard this as like hundreds of times more important than that. So if they really are of equal importance, you're going to have to scale them all to go from 0 to 1, or some similar uh, normalized value before you do the learning. And we'll get to that. All right. Um, <coughs> It's okay that they've rounded off and pre-processed into a range, pre-processed into a range, that doesn't really matter as long as the range is not wildly different than the other 
values that we're putting into the model. Now, housing and median age and median house value were capped, but median house value is our target. So if it's, if it's going to be capped, there are no numbers there higher than 500,000, then we're going to have a problem predicting data behind 500,000 because we don't have any input data covering that part of it. So we'd have to either go back and get proper labels for the cap district or remove those districts that are capped from the training and test set, and then we can extrapolate. Let's see, questions over here. I would not suggest mean substitutions for the missing data. It reduces the variance affecting the prediction. Would you fill the empty rows with the average? Um, yes. Uh, well, we'll talk about that. There are various solutions. There are basically three solutions. You can remove all the rows that are missing data. You can fill them with an average value. And I've forgotten what the third one is. But yes, you're right. Those are, you've got, uh, you understand it correctly there. Those are the various options. All right, so I say these have very different scales. So we'd have to fix them with feature scaling so that they uh, all go over the same range of values. And some are skewed right. So we transform them with a logarithm or something to fix that. So we take 20% of the data and set it aside. So we have a training set and a test set. Filling with random values. Uh, well, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that, filling at random values. I've seen it fill them with zeros or with the medium value. Um, yeah, these are, these are good questions, and uh, I'm not sure I have any more insight to add to it. You're on the right track. All right, so you can, now you can randomly sample 80% of the data, or you can do stratified sampling. Random sampling, in principle, would be fine if your data set is very large. <coughs> But the problem is it can introduce sampling bias. If you do a random sample from population that's 51% female, then the most likely thing is 51% of the random sample will be female. But if your sample is not too large, there's variance here. And so you see you might get only 48% female or 54% female. And if the difference between female and male is important, then your sample will be biased. And this happens a lot in like polls and predictions. So what you do is you do stratified sampling. And here we don't want to sample incorrect uh, amounts from the different income categories because it turns out income is a very strong predictor of the housing value in a, in a real region. So we break the income category into five buckets and then we choose the exactly the right number for the training set and the test set to keep this proportion the way it really is. So all, the, uh, all these proportions stay exactly correct up to three decimal places. So instead of doing a random sampling, we do random sampling of the correct number within each category. That's called stratified sampling. And therefore, the sample is more representative of the whole, assuming that we are correct, and this is an important variable. Um, this is, like I've mentioned before, this is part of the human uh, adding reasoning into the planning of the model and the execution of the model, and therefore, possibly bias and assumptions into it. Uh, it is very far from a pure scientific process where you just take data and run it through an objective mechanistic process. There's humans massaging the data and adding their, their beliefs in here as you go, which you could get disturbed about. But that's the way it is. This is not by any means like a pure science. So let's try a Kahoot. <coughs> I ended up here without a cup to get water and fills his DDoS, so. There's always something. All right, so here's 2A. back. I'm going to go out and drink some water. Right here. Ah, 
Shaj. All right, so if the data changes frequently and is unlabeled, what learning method is best? That's unsupervised from lack of labels, and it's online learning, so you can keep on adding more and more data later, as opposed to batch learning. And this is a review of the stuff we talked about last time. Supervised learning is where you have labels on the data, and batch learning is where you do all the learning in one batch and no more learning after that. And so you want neither of those things. You want unsupervised online learning. All right, what performance measure is preferred if the data has outliers? That should be outliers, not outliners. All right, the maximum average error, uh, mean mean absolute error, not abs uh, that's the best measure that doesn't heavily weight extreme outliers. All right. All right, what sampling system avoids introducing bias from bad luck? That's stratified sampling. You break the important variable into groups and you sample the correct number from each group so that you're not misrepresenting the important variable. Random sampling introduces the issue of just luck. Your random sample might happen to have uh, the, the wrong distribution of an important variable and not be representative of the whole. track here. So now you have to visualize the data, drawing graphs. You can make a scatter plot of the data, but if the data points get thick, they're just going to cover each other, and you don't really know how many dots are there. So if you add to the uh, plot command, you add alpha equals 0.2, that means the dots are only 20% opaque, and now you can tell if the dots pile up deeply, it's different than if they're scattered around. So that gives you more information. Um, you can add another variable and color code it, like here's the um, median income shown, and as you can see, the high income areas are the Bay Area and the Los Angeles area, and inland, the incomes are lower. <coughs> so that's another way to view the data and get it more of an idea of what it looks like. And then you can talk about correlations. Now, a correlation coefficient assumes that there's going to be a linear relationship between one variable and another and finds what the correlation coefficient is, how much extent you can predict one from the other. I see a question here. Can I join Zoom after you're done from this class? Yes, of course. All right. Um, all right. So here's the uh, correlation coefficients. And you see median house value is the thing we're trying to predict. So it's, of course, 100% correlated with median house value. And the question is, what else is correlated? And as we talked about before, the single most important indicator is median income. That's why we took this one so seriously. We even performed stratified sampling to make sure we don't get the wrong distribution of median income, because that's very predictive of house value. You see 68% correlation. 
100% is perfect, 68 is very good. Now you see the rest are pretty much in a small change. 13% prediction from total rooms and 13% prediction the other way from latitude and all the rest really small, 10% or less, not much value at all. So that's a thing to know about. Um, we're finding out which variables are important. Now you can do a scatter plot of them where you have median house value um, and you plot it against other variables. So here you have median income predicting house value with a strong trend, total rooms, maybe a little correlation, housing median age, no apparent correlation at all. This gives you some uh, visualization of which one seems to be the most predictive. And if you look at the median income with the strongest correlation and zoom in on it, you can see in general, the higher income is, the higher the house value is, but now you can see some serious problems. Here's the ceiling of um, predicted house, median house value, hitting this maximum of half a million and not getting any higher, so that's an issue. And you can see, in fact, it seems to be rounded off. There's 450 and 350 and 280. There's also a cluster of points there. And so those are, are not apparently really representative of the actual underlying variable we're trying to predict, but some kind of defect in the data. So we might want to remove those points in those clusters um, that are gonna be a pattern in the data we have that does not really reflect the reality. So correlation always assumes a line. Here's something with a correlation of one, and all these have a correlation of one, two. It doesn't matter how steep the line is. Um, the, and minus one is as predictive as one. Uh, here's what you normally think of, a line plus noise. The more noise there is, the less correlation. If there's no trend at all, it's correlation zero. But if you have a more complicated relationship than a line, like it goes up and down, then the correlation will not be a good measure. Like this has correlation zero, because the line of slope zero is what goes through it all. But in fact, obviously, if you use something more complicated than a straight line, there would be predictive value. And on it goes for these other examples. So that's a thing to know about correlation coefficients. Um, they're limited in that regard. And now you can artificially combine attributes to make new attributes, and those might be more predictive. So here's rooms per house, total rooms over households, bed, total bedrooms over total rooms, population over household. These are variables that might be helpful. <coughs> so you add those, and then you do the calculations again, and now you see that the bedrooms ratio has a 25% predictive power. So this combination of total bedrooms over total rooms is much more useful than either one of those parameters alone. And this is a fairly common situation. All right, so now you gotta prepare the data. So first we gotta fix those missing total bedrooms value. Here's the three ways to do it. Remove the data for those rows. Get rid of the whole attribute in all the data. So we just quit using total bedrooms entirely or set them to some value, like zero, the mean, the medium. That's called imputation. These are various ways to do it. Um, all right, getting rid of the whole attribute entirely seems like we would be quite wasteful to do that because we found up here that um, the bedrooms ratio was quite predictive. So that parameter is useful. So uh, we're choosing the third option here. We just fill it in with the median. All right, another problem is text data. Ocean proximity has five values and they're not numbers and machine learning models like numbers. Now the first thing you might do is just Put, put in a one for this, a two for that, a three for that, and a four for that, and that would turn them into numbers, but that would imply that a one is closer to a two than it is to a three, and these do not have any relationship like that. So that is a, that would introduce a spurious priority relationship between these values and probably harm the model in that regard. So the right thing to do is what's called one hot vectors. Replace it with a five element vector and each one of them only has one one and the rest is zero. So this way you represent there are five possible values here and each one of these alphabetical strings stands for one of those values and has no relationship to any of the others. That is the correct mathematical description <coughs> of that <coughs> column. So that's the one hot vector. Now other things, like we said, the number of rooms goes up to 39,000, but the incomes only go up to 15. So if we don't fix that, it's going to regard this as thousands of times less important than that, and that's not right. So we can scale it. Min-max scaling would just take everything go from zero to one, or minus one to one, which is preferred for neural nets, and you could do that. 
Um, the problem is if you have a few outliers that are much too high, everything else will be shrunk down to the small values there. So you know, another alternative is standardization, where you subtract the mean, then divide by the standard deviation. Uh, this way, it doesn't strictly limit the range. And this will work if you have data that's Gaussian distributive. Um, can you just turn them into binary? Yeah, the one-hot vector. Yeah, that's it. Good. All right. Yeah, I thought the one-hot vector is a good mathematical, mathematically correct solution. Now, next thing is a heavy tail. If you look at this, it's not a peak and then a standard deviation. It's more likely to deviate high than low. And so, to fix this, um, there are various solutions. One is just take the logarithm. That tends to smear it out nicely and make it look more even. That would be one way, or square root. Another solution is bucketizing, where you just group them into categories, like we were doing before for things like, uh, like, median, like median income or something. That's another way to do it, to deal the, with the outliers. Either of those is OK. Because you're just trying to find a way to describe the data that will keep the important features of the data and minimize the unimportant features that just confuse your model, which, again, implies a lot of human judgment going into this. So now you choose a model. Linear regression is one option, where you just have a linear connection for all the inputs. You can uh, get import a model of linear regression, and then you can fit it. But the first prediction is off by more than 200,000. Um, these are the predictions. And um, uh, I think that's this number here. Uh, all right, here's the label. Here's the prediction, here's the label. So we predicted 243,000, but the right answer is 450,000. Here he predicted 370, the right answer is 480, and so on. You can see a simple linear model has not performed very well by this simple test. Just the first five predictions show two of them that are really badly off. So uh, the root mean squared error is what you get here, root mean squared error. That's 68,000. And <coughs> since the housing ranges go from 120 to 265, that's really off by a lot. Um, more than half of the value at the low values and not that much less of the high values. So hopefully we can do a little better than that. It seems like uh, if you want a model like this, we could just assume that everything is 200,000 and we'd have about as good just by flattening everything and not using a model at all. We're not really getting any benefit from the data. So there's another model called a decision tree regressor, which I don't really know exactly what it is. We'll have more details later in the course. But you can download this thing, make a more complicated model. And when you do it, you get an error of zero. And an error of zero suggests that you have too many parameters and you've been able to totally fit the data. That's called overfitting, which means you have drawn some prediction precisely through the training data. But it's not really going to work when you test it against test data because it's not reflecting the real um, properties of the underlying distribution. And so the, the way to evaluate it, rather than that, is to use cross-validation. You split the training set into 10 subsets called folds. Then you do it 10 times. You take nine folds to train it and one fold to test it. And then you just try the other combinations. So you're going to end up with uh, 10 model to train the model 10 times and test its prediction. And now you get a measure of how bad it is. And here's the results. The mean is off by 66,000, which is as bad as linear regression. So even though it looked good with the first test. A more careful test of cross-validation shows that this, uh, this model here, the decision tree regressor, is no better than a linear. So the random forest regressor is another one, which I think combines several models together. And the results are somewhat better, giving us an error of 47,000. But on the training set, the error was 17,000. And so that suggests that we're still doing a lot of overfitting with too many parameters. Um, fitting the training set, but not really capturing the underlying uh, prediction very well, so we missed more on the test set. So none of those models seemed very good. All right, <clears throat> and now you've got to fine-tune your model. Now, we talked about this last time. You can add hyperparameters that do things like just prevent slopes and such from getting too large by just sort of flattening the model to try to prevent it, to try to overcome that overfitting problem where it fits little variations in the test data in the training data, they're not there in the test data. So there is a thing called grid search CSV. This will do a search through possible hyperparameters. You can just tell it what values to try. Another one is randomized search. It will try random hyperparameter values um, to find out what values work best. And another one is ensemble methods that combine several models together. These are various ways to do it. So <coughs> you deploy your trained model after you get it going, 
and then you deploy it perhaps as a web app, then you have your customers, which in this case I guess would be uh, people trying to prepare these loans, investments, they'd be feeding in data, they'd be getting answers, and you'll see how well it works. And then you have to have performance monitoring. This is true of any kind of service. You, something bad might happen. A performance might drop because one of your components might break, or it may just die due to model rot, as you have trained it at a certain snapshot in time, and as time passes, the current situation will change, so your model will be less and less valuable. Another measure is downstream metrics. Um, if you're trying to prepare some product and sell it, you could just see how many products are sold per day, and when that falls, you'll know something's going wrong with your model. Or you can send human raters, sample pictures. If you have a model that's picking defective products on an assembly line, you could just send some of those pictures to humans to rate them to notice if your assembly line automatic detector is not working very well. And it can be a lot of work to set up good performance monitoring, but you have to. Even if your model works today, you can't assume it's going to keep working forever. You have to have some detection of when it's not working right. <clears throat> and then if you want to keep it up to date, you're going to have some periodic process of adding new data and retraining it. Um, you can automate this. You can write a script to train the model. I should say model. My thing is not working. Okay. All right, and fine tune them periodically. You can write another script to evaluate them and evaluate input data quality. So you can do all that. Uh, you should keep backups of every model because it's always possible, like any other IT project, when you make a new version, it might be worse than what you had, and you have to be willing to roll back. That's true of all change management. So, there's another Kahoot. Let's look at 2B. Okay. <coughs> yeah, and I see a question. Are those results the average of the nine out of ten runs? Um, the the uh, there there are. Um, Yeah, these are 10 runs, uh, and these are the mean and standard deviation of them all. So you break it up into 10 groups, and you can pick each group to be the test set, and the other nine are the training set, so there's 10 possible ways to do it. And you try all 10. That's how cross-validation works. And so this is the average and standard deviation of that group of 10. Good. Yes, that's cross-validation. Yeah, that's what he's asking. Good. All right, let's try these. All right, so what analysis method assumes a linear relationship? That's correlations. Correlation coefficients assume a linear relationship.
All right, what analysis method uses semi-transparent graphical elements? Alpha is the measure of transparency in a graphics. Um, a scatter plot without transparency uh, is not too informative because dots cover up other dots. All right, which system fills in missing values with a typical value? That's imputation, that's what they call it. Sort of like inferring, but that's the term for it. All right, what technique splits the data into 10 folds to measure its performance? That's called cross-validation, and it doesn't have to be 10 splits, of course, but some number of splits. this recording.